so on today's episode, we are going to explore the historical and cultural backgrounds of the women in the Bible. And we're going to do so basically because these women have incredible stories that have been forgotten. And I think it's time for us to kind of uncover and discover and bring them back to light and give these forgotten heroines the light and the shine that they deserve for the tremendous work and contribution they have made to not just scripture, but to, um, to you know, to women in the modern world as well. It, their narratives do resonate to date. And to help us do so is our smart sister, Ashley. Hello, Ashley. Welcome. And how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me on your platform. I'm very honored to be here to share the stories um, of our heroines from previous generations and even uh, before and their contributions to the collective. Yeah. And thank you so much for joining us. And as always, we have to remind all our listeners that Ashley's information, her links and all the work she does and all the good stuff she does is going to be in the description section. So please make sure you go and take a peek and see what piques your interest and then feel free to connect with her. Now, before we jump right in, I think I need to inform you all that today's show is going to be a little bit different. We're going to use um, slideshows and I tell you people they're beautiful and I think it's going to be very good for our audience who are more visual and who really you know who learn through verbal nonverbal communication I think this is going to be fabulous now I'm going to bring up the slides as um, Ashley jumps in you know um, into the today's discussion and I'll let her just take it away and start wherever she sees fit so I'm going to do that in a minute I'm going to add this and um, Ashley, you'll just tell me when to pause and how to do stuff. Okay. Yeah, and I will, yeah. So you just give me the go ahead and um, we'll just work through this. So I'd like you just to take it away and maybe we could start by you just telling us, you know, mm -hmm. um, why is lesser known information about these powerful women? You know, why it's not really, um, out there and um, why they're, you know, they're kind of mentioned in the Bible as a, you know, <laughs> by the way, <laughs> you know, they kind of just slide their names or yeah. their names like we don't know like who it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. they're kind of made to be these mysterious, mystical women mm -hmm. and, you know, where you just brush out, you know, brush through their contributions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just, you know, walk us through why you know, these women, you know, why are they not well known and why are their contributions not given credence to, you know, what they really were? In regards to your question, I am going to answer that throughout the presentation mm -hmm. as it is a lengthy answer. Uh, you know, sometimes people ask me like a yes, what they think is a yes or no, mm -hmm. um, like question, but we have to first address the facade you know, break it down and then build up what the truth is. So overall, like, I like the fact that you use the word mystical um, because that's what the divine feminine represents, the mystical hidden realms. And we're going to get to that further on in the discussion as to the esoteric reason why women have been in the background, if you will, or in the shadows. Um, and that's sort of kind of foreshadowing was to come for those that may know about the divine masculine and the divine feminine as in relation to esoteric knowledge. But um, I'm going to get to that in a moment. I really want to back up to the first slide, though, please. Mm -hmm. um, the hidden divine feminine mm -hmm. and divine feminine isn't the modern interpretation of femininity in regards to the soft life or the color palette of pink and purple and uh, you know a lot of the popular so-called knowledge or references to the feminine and even furthermore the divine feminine as that word or that phrase is starting to make a comeback into um, the popular media 
And I just want to address that first because I want people to focus not on necessarily women, but more so the divine feminine, because we are the physical manifestation of the divine feminine principle as far as spirituality. Okay, you can go to the next slide. <laughs> So, hey, it's me, Ashley, <laughs> Minister Ashley, and I spell minister as like a mini star, as we all are stars and we're here to shine into the world. I am an oracle deck creator, an author, and a spiritual biblical teacher. I like to research and decode the Bible. And, you know, you can find out more about me on my platforms that will be, I guess, in the links in the bio or either, I'm not excuse me, not bio, but like description. But you can, you know, find me on fd1111ministries.org or our YouTube platform. Um, yeah, so you can find me there. You can go to the next slide. Awesome. Okay, so I do want to ask a couple questions just to sort of kind of like bring up emotions, but also thoughts. Like, do you think that women are viewed and treated equally to men. Now, hold that, that thought, that answer in your mind as we go throughout this entire presentation. If not, why do you feel and think this? And where do you believe this idea originated from? All right, you can go to the next slide. Now, my personal idea, and I believe that many women and even some men may think this and feel this, that women aren't seen and valued to the same magnitude as men. And um, this is the reason. Well, we have to first understand religion and religion is of oh, the previous slide. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's going on its own. <laughs> um, yeah. So religion is a man-made system. Mm -hmm. And in this system, it operates off of reward and punishment. If you do something good, you get the reward. If you do something that is not good, you will receive a punishment. And with that comes a set of morals. And the, the original word or the key word in morals is customs. And customs are man-made ideas. So it's not necessarily related to a deity, although people in religion will connect it to a deity, because if you have something outside of yourself, instead of looking inside of yourself, that you feel like they have authority over you. And I do believe that religion does have its um, purpose as the animalistic nature of humans. They, we do need some type of organization, but um, that comes pretty much with the balancing of the masculine and the feminine. All right, so being that I deal with the Bible, I'm going to really address the biblical stories and you know all of that. Okay, so in the beginning, in the beginning was Adam. And in church, if you you know grew up in a church like I have, you were taught that Adam was a man, but Adam was not a man. Adam was human. That's what the word means, human. And what is a human? It's a consistency of a plethora of different types of people. And Elohim, mentioned in, Gen in Genesis, is masculine and feminine. So you have the two spectrums of masculine and feminine that physically incarnate as the two expressions of these ideas, these spiritual principles, as a man and a woman. So the first, so there's several different thoughts here. And some religious thoughts. It was Adam and Eve that was almost like a hermaphrodite, if you will. They were like connected. It was like a being, a human that was created. That was one being. And later on separated. Some say that was Eve and others say that was Lilith. And we will get to Lilith in a moment. So through this separation, it wasn't that Adam came first and then the rib was removed later. That word there for what they have translated in the King James as rib is actually side or half. And that's Tesala. Later on, when God is creating a helper, it's not really a helper. That word there is a rescuer. So if you look at the two different words, helper, like oh, I'm here to be subservient to you and help you 
in your agenda compared to the rescuer. Like I'm here to help save you because you really, you know, you need someone there to help you. Well, not really help, but help. Well, let me step away from the word help, but like rescue you from your animal nature. And that's what the divine feminine represents. If you have the masculine, the masculine is the ex external expression of God or like our physical reality, our conscious mind, and then you have a subconscious mind, which would be the divine feminine, which would be like in this example would be like Eve. And if you really look at it, we have both the masculine, the feminine, the conscious and the subconscious that makes up us in our totality as we have both expressions. So if you think about the analogy or either the historical reference of Adam and Eve being one human, this would be the example of ourselves. Like we are Adam, not being fully man, not being fully woman, um, not being only masculine, not only being feminine, but in the totality, we have our external expression and we have our internal world that will be the masculine and the feminine. Now, um, moving on to even Lilith. Oh, you do you have? Yeah, that was interesting when you said the internal and the external. You know, it, I, it just triggered a memory where I read somewhere where the woman was described as the internal, the spiritual, you know, manifestation, and the man is, and I'm just generalizing mm -hmm. this, was the physical manifestation. And so when they merge, then they really balance out a lot because we are in this realm. So you have the woman doing the, you know, naturally moving in the spiritual realm and the mm -hmm. men naturally navigating the physical. And then when they come together, it's really harmonious. So this, it triggered this memory when you mentioned that. I was like, now it makes sense what I read, you know, in some texts, you know. And I don't yeah. know whether that, you have any thoughts on that? Or oh, yeah. I was going to get to that further on, but there is like the alchemical marriage where you have the masculine, the divine masculine and the divine feminine that come together to merge as one. And that's also an alchemy reference, um, you know, as these two seemingly different components come together and they merge perfectly, harmoniously to create a new substance, the third energy. Um, but moving on to Eve and Lilith. For those that may not know about Lilith, she was considered to be Adam's first boo, <laughs> I guess to say. Like, <laughs> she wasn't a wife. She wasn't a wife, okay? <laughs> she was like, I ain't playing that role. <laughs> she was like, no. Mm -mm. But that's like... Um, and, you know, you need to tell us why people don't know about her, because a lot of scriptures, yeah. you, you, um, you've read the missing books, clearly, you know, mm -hmm. Want to be like that's not in my bible i'm just throwing that out there because i know how they get you know? <laughs> yeah yeah well she was removed i mean there's like a lot of historical references some say that she came later because of um don't quote me on this exact part i vaguely remember this it was like another religion that referenced like a female demon energy and um as all religion does eventually accumulate or piggyback off of one another that she later came into the text and she wasn't there originally, but um, you know, you could research that, but Lilith, <laughs> because if, <laughs> I have to giggle just a little bit because Me too. I'm if, really holding this back. <laughs> I know because like they had to clearly suppress her because if people, especially women were to know that, hold up, it was someone that wasn't subservient. And although I don't think that necessarily that Eve was completely subservient, I think she was like a little naive. Um, how they paint her in the text that I have read, like as far as the traditional text. But um, because she wasn't really made to be subservient, but over time she was made to be subservient. I think that Lilith probably was like a spark or a seed within Eve. Now, this is my personal opinion after, you know, reading and introspection and all that, that um, Lilith represents the divine spark and our rebellious nature within all women and really even you know, everyone, but, you know, really in women, that fiery energy that refuses to give up, regardless if we are in a situation where we may not be 
perceived as valuable, that we still find a way how to make it through that situation. And I think that Lilith sort of kind of lives within us all, even to our grandmothers that had to endure harsh treatment or they were neglected or overlooked, that that fire still burned within them. So that's what I personally believe. But yeah, she represents the rebellious energy within us all. And um, so they also demonized her for being rebellious because she was like, I'm not getting on the bottom. Like, OK, you're not doing it right. If you know what I mean, <laughs> you're just not doing it right. Can I let, let me take over, you know? But another thing about the whole Lilith story is that it, it also speaks to women's sexual freedom and their liberal their liberation and uh, you know being able to get what they want, you know, fill in the blank. And throughout the another thing that's tied to the uh, Lilith and Eve dichotomy. Um, as I read further, like in history, well, further this way in history towards modern times, that, um, you know, women were experimented on um, their reproductive systems without their permission. And um, they were also denied orgasms in some, you know, uh, in some literature I've read because it was considered to be linked to linked to this Lilith energy. And even when giving birth, if the baby was breached, sometimes they wouldn't help the woman um, and they wouldn't even give her help during child labor in some uh, like groups. Um, I said, I guess it was Amish. I'm not exactly sure. Don't quote me on that. I remember reading over that material and I was like, that was really harsh because they considered it to be Eve's punishment for being disobedient. So they wouldn't help the woman during that time period when she was giving birth. I know I've read quite a bit of stuff about that. That's horrible. And what you're saying mm -hmm. is it's, it's it's fact. I can I can confidently say this because in many parts of in Asia and Africa, they still do female genital mutilation. They cut up a clitoris. That's crazy. We had a show about that. We've talked about it on our show. I've had several women talk about it, and these are survivors. This is not something in a book. These women are survivors of female genital mutilation. It's a custom, it's a, it's a, it's a culture. And I had one amazing guest who actually told me that it's happening in the Americas. I wasn't aware of that. And she gave me very, very, very important, valuable information. Our audience, I think they learned that for the first time because it's usually um, discussed in Asia and in the African cultures, mm -hmm. but not in the Americas, but it's happening in the Americas at an alarming rate. It's just hush-hushed. And I think these things are hush-hushed because when women are treated in such a way, it's just seen as, you know, I think this is all still the remnants of what you just described. You know, I didn't know how deeply rooted the punishment of Lilith was and the sexual freedom was because these are cultures that are, may not be Christian, but maybe mm -hmm. they have the, the remnants mm -hmm. or the content, knowledge that we have to do this to the woman. It's, yeah. it's so, you know, it's, uh, I'm so glad you brought that up because it's a really important um, thing to consider when we talk about these things. It's happening in 2024 and, um, and, and Gambia just um, voted in uh, a new law to reinstate it as, as something that should be done. In 2024, they justified it. So I just had to say that out there, you know, to our... <laughs> I'm just going to give a shout out to our minister in Gambia, who is really putting her foot down to fight this. And you just, you know, triggered this memory because it's happening. What you said is happening in 2024. Women are not, if there's laws to cut off their clitoris so they don't experience sexual pleasure and pleasure their husbands only. And also with the bathing thing you mentioned, um, when they give birth after this female genital mutilation, most of them, I mean, I don't want to say most because people tell me data statistics, but death is one of the consequences because the way they're stitched up is does not allow for a very healthy, comfortable birth. So they tear, they, they, they end up with fitula. They It's horrible, horrible. It's the bathing process. But again, it's not seen as anything 
what um, yeah so what you just said it just took me back there and so you are really your work is very important because people can now know the origins of the mindset of why people the, the, the men think like this and where the justification is and this is not just scripture it is manifesting in our reality mm -hmm. you know very so, true yeah sorry we just had to interject no, but you just no. took it there <laughs> but um, no, that information needs to be shared yeah go on and that's news to me yeah. Oh, you can go to the next slide. Oh, I should go to the next slide. Okay. Yeah. My bad. <laughs> okay. Um, so segueing to uh, Deborah. Oh, my phone went off. Look. Got some notes over here. Okay. Uh, all right. So the rebellion. Okay. Speaking of rebellion. And not really, she's not really a rebellious spirit, but she's like the force. Like, once again, we're going to this fire, Deborah, and her name means bee. And the bees, her this little bee? Alpha, bee, yeah, that's what it translates okay, as. Yeah, bee. It's so cool. Okay, okay. Yeah. And the fact that bees are very essential to their survival of the world, you know, um, through the population, the spreading of the um, the germination process, okay. Um, but another thing about the bee is one of the three alchemy gifts that the high priest Melchizedek gave to Abram, or Abraham, in the desert, and that's just how essential the bees are. And the queen bee is very essential. A little esoteric note, as I like esoteric. In mystical information. <laughs> I can't do anything without it. Like every oh, all my analogies it's have so ever. It's, yeah. it's not so <laughs> Yeah, it's just in me. It's just in me, you guys. So, you know. <laughs> so she was the one and only female or woman judge, a prophetess, a warrior, a teacher, and a diviner. I added on the diviner part because you will see later on with her name and what it means and um, the divinatory practices that are associated with her archetype. Uh, so her name means torch, lightning, or fiery woman. Okay. Yes, fiery. <laughs> and um, okay. So with her name, let me go get to my, oh, you know, one other thing I forgot to mention because um, I wasn't looking at my notes, is about um, the woman back on the previous slide with Eve. Mm. And I did mention about the helper, but I didn't mention about the word that they have here is um, Isha. Hopefully I'm pronouncing it correctly because, mm. oh no, actually I'm in the right area. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm in the right I, I, further down in my notes. Okay. All right. So with her name and it's lapidoth and that is the fiery aspect the torch or the lightning mm -hmm. now with the lightning and the torch and the fire this could be linked to the divinity the uh, excuse me the divinatory practices of uh, pyromancy and also let me scroll down here now give me a second to pronounce this word is sira on oscopy, mm -hmm. and that's the divinatory practice using lightning and thunder. She's also known to be a warrior and a teacher. So with the teacher portion, you know how they say that women shouldn't teach over men, all of that. Well, in one of the um, Jewish texts, she actually was a teacher. She would sit under a date, a date tree every day and people would gather around men, women, and children and listen to her teachings. She also worked in a temple and this is it's speculative amongst the masses mm -hmm. with her uh, role in the temple as a candle maker, you know, um, in the temple in the Holy of Holies with their rituals, they required incense and candles, so possibly even a candle maker. Uh, Okay, and give me a second. So, not being married. Now, some 
texts say that she was married. Of course, in this culture, being a single woman, that once you became a woman, you were supposed to be married off. So in some texts, they do have her as being married, but they don't have her husband's name. If she was married in a male-centered uh, patriarchal system, why wasn't her husband you know, named? And why wasn't her husband a judge if she was married? These are my questions. Another thing about the word now, um, with either wife or woman, you see how they have her as the woman of lightning. Mm -hmm. um, that is a translation for woman, but it also could be wife. So some people, this is where they get the relation that she could be a wife. But uh, once again, it could also be the, the word woman, and that's Isha. And um, so that's where we get the woman of lightning. Mm -hmm. And let me scroll down. Okay, so her her warrior's name was Barak, meaning lightning. So this could have been like her, I guess, like um, an official under her mm -hmm. uh, when they would go to war. Or this could be making reference to lightning, another form of, like I was mentioning, divination. But it also could speak to, speak to her, her wit. It could speak to her might, especially as she, she was a warrior too. So at times she had to kick a little butt. You know, that's fine. She she got it done though. <laughs> I don't know why these aspects of the mother. I mean, you would be so imbalanced if you were just move. This is this realm requires you to really have a bit of stamina. You know, imagine mm -hmm. you were just. You know, you're dancing with the fairies. Yeah. <laughs> all, as a judge. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. is um, a really fascinating woman. I read a yeah. little bit, well, not a little bit, I've read quite a bit about her. And I can understand the debates was she married, was she not married? Because when the scriptures are so distorted and they've made copies mm -hmm. of copies of copies of mm -hmm. copies of copies, of course, there's information getting lost. Mm -hmm. And then you are digging deep. I'm sure you, I can tell from this information, you've read the Apocrypha and you've read the Book of Enoch and you've read all these other texts, which people may not want to read, but then they may question what you're mm -hmm. saying, but you're actually going to dig deeper, you know? Yeah. So I can understand if you're just going by the Bible as you mm -hmm. have it, that are sold everywhere you won't understand where she's coming yeah. from and, you know yeah. take the information and research it and then you will find what mm -hmm. she's talking about because it's not it, yeah. it is there mm -hmm. um and the thing is is that like before like we're taught to listen like the whole system not just of religion in the organization of church and i'm gonna get to that further in the presentation but you have to understand when they go to be ordained, they have to go through a school and that school already has a set agenda. No different than when we send our children to school or the doctor goes to school. They are there to practice what they learned. So when you go to ask your pastor or your minister or your deacon, um, Sunday school teacher, a question, they're going to give you the regurgitated answer that was given to them. Now, we are challenged to be studiers of the word, 2 Timothy 2.15, one of my favorite scriptures, Ooh, to be studiers of the word. Mm -hmm. But I will take it a step further and say researchers of the word, because before when I was in church, I was studying the word as it was given to me. Something didn't really feel right at times, but I was like, well, I'm studying what they told me to study the way how they told me to study. So I would say be a researcher of the word, of everything, you know, if you're taking a medicine, I would say research it too, you know, that's just my personal opinion with that section about, you know, medicine, food, everything, because really, honestly, it's all linked back to us. Everything is centered around us and our lives. I'm not living my life for you. You can't live your life for me. I can only live my life for myself and whatever information comes to me, I'm responsible for that. You know, especially as we living in the information age, it's no need for to just be like, I hate to say it this way, but not really <laughs> dumb followers. You know, <laughs> honestly, they had excuses then, 
you know, but yeah. we don't have excuses now. Like we really literally, don't. like yeah. literally, the books are out there. And, and you yeah. know, back in the day, these books cost a lot of money. The yeah. scholars who wrote these books, they paid thousands of dollars for mm -hmm. one or two modules. Now they even give it to you for free. Yeah, PDF download. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> there is no really excuse. And, yeah, you know when you talked about the the health, the doctors, and you said they practice medicine. I was mm -hmm. like, yeah, they practice. <laughs> yeah, don't get me started on that. Um, that sorcery, pharmacia. Like I have the one of the other presentations I did about um, medical. Well, not really medical, but herbal sorcery and uh -huh. the origins of that. Don't get me started on that. <laughs> yeah. But that's something you know our audience you can look it up she's already given you the she's dropped the pebbles on the road <laughs> to your research you know yeah 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 and and yeah these are these women uh they're really i mean it was and also as you were talking about um what they're taught and how they're taught and you regurgitate the information they were mm -hmm. also taught that women cannot be teachers women should be submissive mm -hmm. women should be a b da 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 so when a woman is teaching them there's mm -hmm. a block yeah yeah and this yeah, goes for both women and men i know women who would yeah. not receive the message from a woman she would rather mm -hmm. receive it from a man because of this yeah. block because the mm -hmm. visual of this smart sister here or some you know bishop or whatever with a, who's a woman teaching you the image is provoking your conscious subconscious mind yeah you, this can't be so that also mm -hmm. affects the, the learning you know, when a woman teaches, yeah. and this we know this goes to the boardroom and many places. Women, mm -hmm. people don't listen when women speak, but I won't go into yeah. that. And it, yeah. uh, it comes from a lot of things. Yeah, yeah it's the program. Yeah, Bora was the first bishop, and mm -hmm. of course, these are modern words. Bishop does have his origins in in Greek, but however, like <sighs> deep breath. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the, there's two words in the Old Testament that is the equivalent of a, a pastor or a bishop in the New in the New Testament. Okay, so we have shaphat, which is judge. These are attributes. So, like with a, a pastor or a, or a bishop, they're to be a good, favorable judge, judge of character. And this happens in the spiritual realms. Like you can't just, she didn't nominate, she didn't nominate herself to be the judge. Like, oh, I'm going to be the judge. It had to be a spiritual gift. And another word, give me a second to get myself together for to pronounce this, Kubernetes. And that means governing, but having the spiritual gift of dictatorship, being able to delegate these tasks. So she had these two gifts. And the equivalent of this in the New Testament that word is a piece of give me a piece copio and that is used in the greek in the new testament and that's the equivalent of a bishop and of a pastor and both of these mean the operation of overseer being able to oversee the congregation or the people that you're oops, <laughs> that you're supposed to be ruling over okay and these are spiritual gifts He's All right. Now moving. Gift. Yeah. Spiritual gifts. And remember that in these cultures, being culture based and language based, uh -huh. that um, they have the words have an entire meaning to it. Like if I say, oh, judge, what do you think about? You think about a, a gavel, a guy with a gavel and, you know, ready mm -hmm. or, you, you know, and you think about this, but when they have these words in, in the culture, it's a whole custom that comes along with it, a whole mentality that comes along with okay. these words. You know, we only have dry English. English. Yeah, I'm just thinking that what you just said, and I can, because I speak different languages, I can relate to what you're saying. And yeah. when you speak different languages, you realize that English is very limited in how it describes things. Mm -hmm. and, um, some are like five words. Some languages have five words into one mm -hmm. word and you can play around with them. Mm 
mm -hmm. interchangeably to change the context, the meaning, yeah. you know, everything. And the same words, just switching the position and just, yeah, and exactly. What you're saying is is fact, and people who speak other languages know what you're saying. Yeah, we get yeah. It now what you mean. Right? Yeah, and Mary Magdalene, um, a preacher. Yes, and the Latin origin of the word preacher is to declare or proclaim. And what did she do? She proclaimed the power of Christ. She proclaimed her story and her relationship with him. And, you know, he has risen, you know, you know the story. Um, but moreover with that, give me a second, scroll down. Okay, so she wasn't a prostitute <laughs> as we probably may have gathered from either pop culture or the whole church field. I know for a while I thought that until I did my own independent research. Um, so it was that story came from the Pope Gregory the first, but however, in the 1960s, the Catholic church had to apologize. In the gospel of Mary Magdalene, she traveled to spread the good news. She proclaimed like pretty much almost worldwide, not completely worldwide, but you know, she did her thing. And um, she even in, in the book of the Mary Magdalene that she had Jesus's child known as the Holy Grail in some customs and beliefs. She was a female preacher like Junia, Phoebe and others. You can go to the next slide. <laughs> yeah. Because so like had a child, um, Ashley. Yeah, yeah. According to like one school of belief, and that will be like some say it's um, Rh negative, I think, or like a blood type that that's supposed to be like the offspring of Jesus's child. Okay, that's um, an interesting one. Yeah, that is interesting. Up, up. yeah. But um, the, Mary Magdalene is an interesting um, mm -hmm. um, woman because there's also the the conversation around was she one of the disciples? Mm. Yeah, yeah, in the book, yeah, she was, and also I think in the I think in the book of Thomas, too. Mm -hmm. It's a it's another book that she was like a disciple. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay. Well, they needed some feminine energy up in there anyway. I mean, like. <laughs> they needed a lot of it. <laughs> yeah, shoot, right? Yeah, we're we going to get to that in a little bit. <laughs> now, in the next slide, <sighs> this scripture has been thrown at me so many times. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So this is a letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And he was in uh, Thessalonica trying to establish a church. And there that was, um, you know, goddess veneration was uh, highly in regards in that area. And um, so the women there, they, they were like revered equally, if not even more than the men in, in the culture. And so to give some type of structure, that was Paul's opinion, because he starts it off like I suffer not. And he's talking about himself and he's giving advice. He's not saying that I received the divine uh, vision and, you know, Christ came to me and told me that this is what you're supposed to do. Women's supposed to be sitting there. He didn't say that. He said in his opinion. Yeah, That's just very basic, right? I'm sure you'll go into it. The book of Paul, the book the, of Paul, um, Timothy, and the Council of Nicaea. Those culprits. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, the book of Paul, I haven't read that, but because I like, I like to dig deep. So maybe mm -hmm. I probably skimmed over it. But I'm a dig. I'm a I'm a digger. So I, I like. I, I can't really speak on that. <laughs> I, I'm a digger. So. <laughs> Um, you can tell because these are not in the Bible, Bible, you know? They're, yeah, they're yeah. A little bit. Yeah, and, and Timothy, yeah, go on. Timothy. Yeah, but like a Paul, you got to understand his background. He was a militant figure, hmm. um, very dominant 
you know, high ranking official in the military. And he had that tactical mind. Like, how do you go and establish a religion that I can spearhead and putting himself in a position that we're still talking about him to this day? Very smart, I got to say, you know, mm -hmm. as far as solidifying his legacy. Mm -hmm. And what better way to do that than to structure the new religion where he's at the, for the forefront? And how do you do that if you have... First of all, he came from he's he's Jewish. So he came from the culture where women were second, you know, like property. So when you are trying to conquer another nation, you're going to have to instill some structure there. How do you do that? You just take the same model that was in a previous. Um, like a previous area and you just apply that same tactics to that new area. That's the thing I can say. He was brilliant with, you know, that. Yeah. He did what he came to do. I'm not saying I agree with it, but I mean, you know, we can take some tips from him <laughs> if we're trying to, you know, structure something, tear down something. I mean, old. very strategic and political mm -hmm. at the time because the Council of Nicaea, I know you're going to talk about it as well. That's all they were doing. It was politics. And then yeah. they had to rearrange shift the pieces yeah. on the deck to make it suit the agenda yeah and yeah. paul was it was hit the you know it was their time you know they used it yeah like yeah um yeah like the the key word in the the scripture that people uh focus on with being quiet be silent women da, 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 all that is has a kia and that does mean quiet, stillness, and silence, but peace. And it speaks to an overall practice of inner peace. This same word is mentioned in two other instances that has nothing to do with women sitting still. It's about silence. And it's in Acts 22, 2, as well as in 2 Thessalonians 3, 12. And because um, another thing too, if this was a direct commandment, for women to be still, be quiet, don't talk, don't usurp your authority over a man, then why did Paul follow up in Galatians saying that we are all one, like the um, Gentile men and women are all one in Christ. So it's either like he's being hypocritical or either people are misinterpreting this to fit their agenda. And to me, it all makes perfect sense because who's in the church? It's the women. Yeah. The churches that are thriving. Yes. The mega church. You do not thrive without your spiritual army. And I'll, yeah. it's the women. It's the women. Now we get to that too. Island, they're worshiping, they're giving a lot of power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of their power and essence in the church, and they're yes. elevating these men on the pulpit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all yeah. your energy, women. It's all of you. Look around you in those churches and know that is your doing. That's your inheritance. Mm -hmm. I'll leave it there, because it really gets on my last nerve when you are you you you're benefiting from the energy, the wisdom, the knowledge mm -hmm. of women, and then you're you know you're hitting them and you know trying to you know make them feel like they're not contributing anything they're not contributing equally they're not valuable and we know that that's not the case they are key yeah you know without the women there is no church yes say. exactly there is not the church. churches will shut down they will close down you know so this is you know quiet stillness silence peace yeah it's 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 a it's a paradox like just yeah yeah it doesn't make any sense you know just from and and you know this is something you can go and look you know um go to any church just walk in pick any it's women yeah majority women okay. but yeah this um speaks to a practice of inner peace it speaks to the holy spirit and um the holy spirit the rahako kadash the shakana and that's what the divine feminine is. It's really the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to get to this, um, yeah, in a 
moment. Okay, so the fear of the womb, like how you were saying, <laughs> the women are the wisdom. Okay, so the fruit of the womb is wisdom. You can go to the next slide. So I, I actually, too, I remember reading uh, in some Jewish texts. I was reading several like Jewish texts or whatever, um, and they were saying that they didn't want their they were giving the commandment to the husbands not to leave from the temple reading the Torah and to go home and teach it to their wives because their wives would use their wisdom to persuade their husband. And I'm like, if you are supposed to be the head of the household, you're supposed to be strong, you're supposed to be in, you know, the word of God and strong in God, then how can you be persuaded by your wife if she's supposed to be subservient to you? But I think this is related to Delilah. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. And also, I think we need to touch on this word rebellious, because any woman who just moves a little bit you know, out, just does things out of the norm or out of just steps out of the line or out of the box is just still rebellious. You know, yeah. just rebellious. So Deborah, rebellious. You know, they just yeah. call this rebellious. But it's what, yes. please touch on this as well. Why this word rebellious? Well, I think it is. Now, I haven't broke down the etymology of the word, though. But, um, and of course my mind is starting to work now looking at the word, but I think it is just a way how to try to control people, period. Um, I did a blog post in a video on Jezebel and the misconceptions about Jezebel. Now I'm not saying that she, you know, didn't, she did one like thing that I consider to be really like out of, out of pocket, but she was a ride or die, you know, she was about her husband. She got him that field. She got, you know, she she was a woman that made it happen. And people will say a woman wearing too much makeup or you're a Jezebel. You don't even know what a Jezebel is. You're just throwing it out, trying to insult someone. And, it, and with Delilah, she was demonized as a, you know, rebellious woman or a fast woman. There's actually no reference to her, real reference to her being a prostitute or a harlot. Now, it she could have been like maybe not a, a virgin or something like that, but she was not promiscuous. There's no like real reference to her being like a, a whore, like, you know, taking payment for that service or anything. But um, the one thing that I do appreciate about her overall is that she represents independence and she represents some modern woman may say like a gold digger but um but she represents like being able to see an opportunity and taking advantage of the opportunity now she was a tool of god because samson what was he supposed to be doing he was supposed to be fighting the philistines and you know eradicating the enemy but he was focused on getting some honestly because he had in other texts he had like a wife and then he had somebody else and then he but he was in love with delilah i really enjoy, Womanizer. I enjoy your, your 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 ministry you know i think your church would be on and coffee <laughs> 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 he was busy getting some <laughs> yeah, he was, he was just, you know that's that this is your thing so much that was the ministry right there he wasn't doing the lord's work that was his ministry getting a little something <laughs> yeah that's yeah. Yeah, you know, Jezebel, she was a ride or die, right? <laughs> like Yeah, yeah, she was. <laughs> Most men would want a woman like that, you know? Yeah, yeah but you, you know, they just very, you know, people be like, you know, ride or die, you know, it's you really connect with you know, <laughs> getting some <laughs> Yeah, that's what we're I, mean, I just had to laugh because I was holding it back in. I'm like, I like this church. <laughs> 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 yeah, if, you know, I I shouldn't even have interrupted you because oh, no, you know, no, no, no. Going to, mm, it's fun. You know the hobby. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. I am going to do like a a blog and a video about her because she is a head worker. She was a head worker, so there's two references with head worker, like someone that uses the art of seduction to sway a person. That could be one, you know, thing that she did, but she also was literally a head worker. So your head, um, your hair is connected to your nervous system. And basically by them cutting, remember his, his strength was in his hair. So they cut off his hair 
he, he became weakened because of his, uh, 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 excuse me, because of his nervous system. Um, you know, you, you go, know I'm saying, and what, what was she doing? Yes, yes. He was working his head. She was That's what a head head. worker is. Yeah, well, not really cutting the hair. I mean, it could no, 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 be like the hair, hair. but like working the head. Like, yeah, it could be verbally implanting the ideas mind. into the head. The mind. Yeah, the mind. But also sometimes like what they would say with head working is like a person that could massage the head too, because you have different pressure points and and uh yeah, pressure points for lack of a better word, in your head. So the temples, remember the temple, the holy of holies, the temple, temple. Yes, they say that you know the, even the way it is, um, all the, the names of the places. Yeah, they and they they divide the um, the brain up. I don't know all of those, you know, left hemisphere, yeah, yeah. right hemisphere, and then all these other um, hippocampus or all of those. Um, yeah, so those people that know these different sections of the brain that can work it. Uh, you know, I don't know a whole lot about it. It is interesting, you know. It's but, really, um, really interesting because a lot of these um, ancient, you know, women, and I mean, it doesn't matter, men or women, they knew a lot of science mm -hmm. about the science. It was just called knowledge, you know, sacred knowledge or, mm -hmm. you know, the magis, you know, everyone had a consult, you know, all the kings had the, the, the seer or the woman or, yeah. the, or the healers they knew it was biology and science. They just called it something different. So that's yeah. why I was very interested when you said head work. I was like, you know, she must have had a lot of knowledge on the body, you know, how the mm -hmm. mind works, responds, you know, to the anatomy and, you know. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And the more that, cause like I have my, my ebook and I'm converting it to a paperback. So I'm adding even more, you know, information into that book. And the more that I dive deeper into the, practices, the ancient practices and divination and magic, the more that I realized that these high priests were, they were doing all kinds of stuff. Like this could have been a sacred science. Um, I don't know the exact word for it. It's so many of them of working the head, just with touching the head and examining the head. It could have been a form of divination. You'd be surprised how much divination is tied to the medical field. Yeah, the touching of the head in a lot of culture. I don't know. I know in my culture, Blessing. when babies are born, nobody is allowed to touch the head, the sensitive yeah. part of the head. You don't touch it, you know, and mm -hmm. the head is protected. You know, also, you know, people say the African women tie the head wrap for mm -hmm. beauty. No, it's for a lot of things. For protection. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, um, yeah this is still sensitive right here. Yeah. Like even if you get sunlight right here, it's good, you know, to have sunlight shine on, on the yeah. top of your, mm -hmm. yeah, like um, every so often, you know. Nice. This is interesting knowledge. It's really worth doing a deep dive because it's yeah. understanding the body, you know, and the mind, you know? Yeah. You can go to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, you can go to the next one. This is pretty much just the filler one. Um, so the biggest lie that the church told people is that it was a religion and it was a building. Because the church, you're looking at it. You are looking, I'm looking at it. You know, we are the church, um, not just our physical bodies, male and female, but also especially women. You can go to the next slide. Let me see what I have on the next slide. Okay, Divine Femme, you can go to the next one. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, here we go. All right, so this oh, is the breakdown. This is I'm gonna use my little, my little crystal. Um, okay, so this is what I mean by the women are literally the church. The entire religion, as well as the physical church is the replica of a woman. Okay, so you have the womb up here in, okay, I guess on your, okay, the left, you the brown, you see the little brown square on the left yeah, with the yeah, dots? It's, right? it's the squares with the symbols, the four symbols yeah. on the top. Mm -hmm. um, well, maybe, okay, yeah, all right. So this is an ancient 
B, the uh, letter for B, Bet. And the Bet was like the tent or the tabernacle. Uh, this would be modern day, what they call the tabernacle would be like the church. Okay. So you see that little dot in the middle. Yeah. That represents like, okay, so the bet, the temple would be the woman, the womb. Ooh. The dot in the middle would be like the child. Mm -hmm. And remember uh, the culture is centered around everything is centered around the the culture is centered around um day-to-day -day life so day-to-day -day life you have the the woman like say this was like a literal house mm -hmm. um the woman and child in the inside of the tent or the tabernacle mm -hmm. and the man that sits on the outside to protect what is inside this is symbolic of the conscious mind masculine sitting on the outside to protect the subconscious mind because once something is uh, implanted aka impregnated into the subconscious mind it grows yes so the womb represents the subconscious mind but it also represents what they call now the church because the church is supposed to be like where you go into the the temple to worship or worship is a spiritual experience it's a it's letting down the conscious mind the physical defenses so that way the subconscious can take over aka the spirit what they call like the holy spirit can take over so you can't just let anything inside of the tabernacle into the tent because it will grow so the masculine this is the whole concept of all religions but i'm just going to focus on bible okay so the when they say that the man is supposed to be like protecting going out da, 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 doing all this it's not talking about a physical man. It's talking about the masculine. With my masculine expression created this slideshow. But my subconscious mind uh, formed the idea and they work together to create. They create together. My spirit, my divine feminine energy is the create the creative force. The, the creator, the imagination. My physical body goes and do's at the command of the subconscious. So once it's programmed into the subconscious, the physical body will carry it through. Our actions, our words will carry it through the masculine expression. Over here on the right hand side, this is the Hebrew letter for A, Aleph. You see how it is almost like the Aries sign, the glyph for Aries. Well, yeah, the ram. Huh? Wrong. <laughs> yeah, the, the ram. Yeah. It, or either ox, the ram, ox. Um, and so that's the head of the year. Uh, that is the spring equinox. What happens in spring? Life forms. Pregnation, then the, like the life comes to life <laughs> in spring. If you take this Aries glyph and you see the ovaries and this whole reproductive system system right here of the of the womb of the woman mm -hmm. it fits into the aries glyph fits into mm -hmm. into that it's all symbolic what what happens on e star spring new life comes forth yeah what happened yeah the death burial and resurrection mm -hmm. that's a analogy for the reproductive system, death, burial, and resurrection. Mm -hmm. Which is the properties of the woman. Now with the chalice here, they have the Eucharist and you know, like the bread and then the wine. What is the wine symbolic of? The menstrual cycle. You see the chalice, chalice right here over in the far right at the bottom. And they Stop. <laughs> yes, and have some. <laughs> and you know, in the Are Old Testament, serious right now. What I, yeah. I this is a very serious slide right now. It's going to either hit hit you really hard if you're not open minded. You're going to be very, um, very, yeah, yes. because. We've gone from the ovary, we've gone to the chalice. 
and the chalice you can literally see it it mirrors especially one two three four the fifth one Sorry. the golden one with the hands and you can mm -hmm. i mean you can see you know what it means and mm -hmm. and this is what they use for the eucharist mm -hmm. drinking yeah. the, the blood okay. and let me tell you i've been doing the research in the Old Testament. That is why I was, hold on, I had to ask you that because this is, you know, come on now. Yeah, like the more I dig, the more I'm like, ooh, this is juicy. Ooh, now how am I going to present this? You know, but um, yeah, I was just like in, in my book, I was doing some research about blood magic and the divination. And then, you know, the holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which is opposite house of Aries. So Aries is the head of the year, the ram. Opposite would be Libra, the Day of Atonement. Libra is to balance the scales. Yeah. What has to happen. Yeah. A sacrifice has to happen. And that's where you have the, you know, the sacrifice of the goat, um, of the ram. Once again, uh, so the son can be reborn. And well, hold on. What was I about to say? Oh, yeah. Okay. So I was researching that that day and the sacred practices that they do in the Holy of Holies is a bloodbath. It's all about blood. And why is it all about blood? What, what did they say in the Old Testament about women? When they start their menstrual cycle, they have to be sequestered for seven days. Yes. And in these sequestrants, I, I guess that's the word. But anyway, when they come together, the women... They were in sync, meeting outside of the city, uh, a temple. Now, this isn't in the, um, oh, that was, oh, that's my, I'm oh, sorry. I was wondering what that sound was. Okay. Um, now, this isn't in like regular text or anything, but they would meet together because they would ovulate. And it, when they come together, sequester together, they're doing these rituals. They were considered amongst, um, in the text, as unclean. They couldn't be touched for seven days. Seven days is a is a week. It's a completion. And um, and what happens when they would come together, they would worship together pretty much. They would come together and they would do their sacred practices. And they have this pool. I don't remember what it's called, but after they would finish, you know, their their cycle, they would go into this um, ritual pool and they would cleanse themselves. It was only uh, meant for that purification process. But the reason why they would call them unclean is because they they understood the regenerative properties of, of this cycle because it does represent death, burial, resurrection, but as well, it's really life. What they say is life in the power and power and life in the in the blood. Would they say I about that? Say that. Yeah, they say, say that. Blood. And it's whose blood? Everything is in the blood. They cover themselves yeah. with the blood. Everything in the church is about. If that's not blood magic, I don't know what it is. Like, yeah. in the world. Like but, they cover their homes yeah. with the blood. The Passover, what they The Passover of the lamb. What is the lamb? Look at the ram. Look at the ovaries. Okay. So. Ooh, yeah, I just. I, yeah, it's all. It's all over the door. Yeah. And so, like, what, what blood are they talking about? They demonize the woman for this cycle, but then they take it. Huh? Is that the blood they're talking about? The woman's blood? Yeah. That's what symbolic. I mean, they're not going to explicitly say it because. Obviously, no. if, if they knew how powerful, if they were to admit how powerful women are, that means that they would have to, they would have to either make, make it equal or either bow down. And it's a, it's a ongoing battle with that now. I stay out of it, you know, because, you know, it's just not my thing, at least not right now. I don't know where God's going to lead me, but this may lead somewhere right here. Just me saying this. This slide alone is a whole book. And you know what? The more I study, because I added a, a section, being that I am a woman and I am teaching and all of that, I had to add a section for women. So that way I could address 
not this part, but, you know, the teaching part. So that way I can make myself qualified. If you know what I'm saying, because you it, are. I just this, is really, this is happening. Japan, 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 Japan um, takes, um, they pay women to give their menstrual blood for research and regenerative makeup. That's and, the source that you can. I was going to say, wow, it's that's interesting. interesting. Japan you know, we had for a long time for stem cell and other research. Japan. Wow. Mm -hmm. So it's not something you're really. I mean, you have the sources in Japan. They're all in the the blood. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you wouldn't be short of scripture. Yeah. I am so shocked right now. I don't know if you can see it on my face, but I am just shocked because you just go. Ooh. Just I ne I I I could I never you know I always thought there was something wrong with the Eucharist. I'm just gonna tell you, it never made sense to me because mm -hmm. I just couldn't get it. Like, why are you eating the flesh and drinking mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. in remembrance? Why? Yeah. You know, why it never ever ever made sense to me. Now, but I always thought that was I never knew you know this was this you know. Yeah, me neither. Until kept researching. I always thought it was just some kind of weird, you know. Weird. Because <laughs> I also wondered about the obsession with blood in blood. Yeah. Yes. The blood. The blood. And they, I, I, I call on the blood. I pray the blood. I'm like, what is going on? Yeah, and you don't think it's like weird? Well. Yeah, and we also you said something also that is scientifically proven, and that is when a group of women, and I'm, I'm sure you maybe you've mm -hmm. not experienced or you have experienced this when you are um, friends with a certain group of women, your mm -hmm. periods all sync up. All start to sync up. Yeah. yeah, in high school we all knew. <laughs> Once you yeah to connect to each other in class, <laughs> you know, you would sync up and have your periods, you know, just back to back. Your work colleagues, it happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and this culture is sort of kind of sad, though, because, like, I grew up, it would be, like, the worst thing ever to happen, and you, um, you know, it's just nasty, but if you really look at it, it's beautiful. Like, you can do, as a side note, you know, some people may think it's gross, but anyways, I don't really care anymore, but, uh, you know, literally, like how you said with Japan, they are right on target. They know, they know, um, like, with your 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 blood literally it holds life and it does have like youthful properties to it that you can utilize on your skin you can utilize for a lot of things they were sprinkling blood on the altar up in there um in the old testament slaughtering all kinds of things and sprinkling blood here blood there and all that and but yet people don't think that's weird the church is all about blood sacrifice. yeah blood I, I, for me this is what made me go like uh, you know that was the thing that made me go uh, you know um it was off you know all that blood sacrificing thing I, yeah it was off and this is now a whole other twist to the tale <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness yeah oh ashley this is something this is That's something i'm just you know i'm just visualizing the catholic church you know mm -hmm. and with the chalice and their candles because it talks about when deborah you're talking about the candle mm -hmm. you know, i just i just seen all of it you know the altars and all kinds of things another thing too uh, yeah i'm sorry oh, we yeah, have to do it again with um other stuff like this was fun i know oh we finished this is it yeah, is it another script? Like, is this? Oh, I played it. Okay. This is it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's oh, it. Oh, we did well. Yeah. <laughs> so much yeah. time we have left. Okay. This is really, really good. Okay. So, oh yeah, yeah. I, I let me add on one other thing because I didn't uh, get to that in the slideshow. Okay. So mm -hmm. when we, you were asking me something about like marriage, something. But anyways, I'm gonna break it down real quick. Okay. So the reason why marriage is such a focal point in religion mm -hmm. and the reason why they made women subservient to mm -hmm. men because if a woman knew that she was equal to a man she knows that she has the right to challenge him 
So what they would do, if you're building a nation, you want as many people to back you up in your nation and in your movement, in your decisions. Mm -hmm. The kings, and now we have um, like presidents and you know all these rulers and stuff. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you get all of these pieces, pawn pieces, to fight for you? You um, put them into you give them a reward first of all. The reward would be okay. You go out, you do this for me, you win. And you come back and you get to settle down. You get to have your own kingdom. Your own kingdom would be your household. And you are the ruler of your household. You will have a prize, a woman. So that way you can carry on your lineage. And guess what? You carry on your lineage, have as many kids as you want, you know, and the ruler knows that they're going to have troops that will be able to back up whatever plan that they need to have done. So that's the, the reason why they made marriage like oh the central figure because like even in other ancient cultures like it was you didn't have to get married like sometimes people had several booze or you know wives or husbands or free you know like in my now over my research and also you know just gathering information over my lifetime that it never really is natural for people just to find one person and just stay there mm -hmm. especially if you're if you don't plan on being adventurous like the way how societies are set up um in order for it to feed a society you have to have bodies to feed that society and to give the energy like the matrix so in to keep people in that society what will keep them anchored there family a job familiarity that will keep them anchored there. So the whole design, I mean, it's pretty genius, but also can suffer people that know that they may not be made for that lifestyle. But however, being that it was tradition, being that this is what the norm is, I feel like I have to uphold it. And I, you know, thought that too for the longest time. But, you know, um, I realized that, you know, that was just a design made by men and it's not necessarily a God made design because we're going to naturally procreate anyway, whether we have a spouse or not, no different than animals. Although we have a higher nature than animals, not to abuse them, of course, but you know, we do have a higher intellect in some cases, not all, you know, <laughs> some people, you know, I'm like, hmm, you yeah, know. exactly. The dolphins may defar. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so some of the animals, if you watch them right now, you know, they'll, they're, they're putting some humans to shame. I'm gonna just say it like that. I, yeah, I agree. I agree. That's why I compassion, you know, e emotional quotient and intellectual is, 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 is out there, is up there. And some humans are just like, yeah, I know. I just don't like where's the empathy, where's the love, where's the compassion, yeah. you know, um, the animals just do it, like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> No questions and, asked, yeah. Yeah, like, what in the world? Yeah. And that's the reason why, you know, like, marriage and the inequality was developed. So they can pretty much have people to run their societies for them. They can have that continual, like, I think about a, a hamster wheel and something, a device hooked up to the hamster wheel, wheel and society is running on that hamster wheel and it's powering, power, powering a higher source. <laughs> and, you know, the whole matrix, if you've ever seen the matrix, how that is set up. Yeah. And when you talk about marriage, you can see the, the, the trends in polygamy and mm -hmm. uh, polyandry, polyandry mm -hmm. is um, women with multiple husbands. Women, yeah. Polygamy is the men with multiple wives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, <laughs> when I look at some of the families that promote polygamy, I'm like, they know nothing about it because mm -hmm. in the African context, the men who had back, back, way, way, way back, mm -hmm. what you're saying, most men used to refuse the wives <laughs> because it was too much. They were like, no. Oh, please. gosh. <laughs> Yes, they were refused. And I'm talking about things I know for real, for real. I didn't read mm -hmm. the book. I know these families. You know, I've talked to these great grandfathers and were mm -hmm. like, I didn't even want my second wife. <laughs> you know, I, I was trying mm -hmm. to dodge it because I only <laughs> wanted my first wife. <laughs> wow. Because it required you to mm -hmm. build homes, the same homes, mm -hmm. 
each wife, it required you, you had to do so much. And also these men were in love. They, and they all admitted every grand old, you know, these are old, old grand, grand, great. They loved one wife. There was a favorite wife. They loved her. And the mm. rest were not love. They were responsibility based on culture. Mm. It was called wife inheritance. So, mm, I've heard of that. Yeah, they didn't want it. It was a responsibility. Mm -hmm. Again, you're talking about culture and tradition. They were like, it's my duty. You know, so all these things, they're just like you said, people are put into these um, different programs and they don't know the full story. You mm -hmm. know, and also the real polygamy that I know about in Africa, the wives picked the wife. Mm. The wives. That's I mean, and if you want to prove me wrong, I want you to do your research in the East African countries and you will find a thousand tribes that will tell you the wives picked the wives because mm -hmm. they had to invite the women they wanted to welcome into their home and decide, I want this wife. They picked the wives and um, it was mostly economics, you know, if they were wealthy because the women were running the home. So she needed help. She then picked the wife like, a, you know, you should pick her like a great business partner. <laughs> you know, That makes sense, though. It is like a business. Yeah. So it's not what people say a lot. You know, I have all my booze, three wives. I'm just like, that's just. Yeah, they have the wrong idea about totally. it. Totally. Yeah. But we could go yeah. on and on about marriage and wives and all this stuff. And, yeah. um, and I would like to thank you. <laughs> thank you for the invitation. You're welcome. Yeah. And I hope you'll come back. You're most welcome. I will. I will. We had so much fun. I'm sure this one is going to be something <laughs> for our audience. And this was fun. Word. Anything oh. that you want to say before we head out? Um, <laughs> you the last you know, I would just say question everything in research. Wonderful. So this was um, Minister Ashley, our today's smart sister, hanging out with us. And um, we really enjoyed hanging out with her. And um, remember, everybody, if you want to connect with her, all the information is in the description section. Thank you, Ashley, for today. And thank you. look forward to another share in the near future. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. You have a blessed one. Thank you.